Good morning. Today we're going to study single phase motors. This will be the last motor you're going to study in actuators and power electronics. And uh, lecture 20 will be on transient response. And then after that, we have a review and we are ready for the design project presentations. So this is the last actuator covered in this course. We're going to study single phase induction motors specifically. We study induction motors before, but those induction motors had three phases. In a conventional, uh, typical household, you only have access to one phase. So how can we adapt those motors to now run with a one phase only, which would make their applications a lot easier? That we're going to see in this uh, in this lecture. You already have an answer to that. We could simply take a AC supply, a one phase AC supply, convert that into DC, use a three um, phase inverter to create a three phase AC signal and then uh, connect that to the motor. But that would take a lot of resources to implement this circuitry. If we can develop a system that runs at one phase only, that would make the application in the applications a lot easier because you can have access directly um, to this one phase AC in a conventional outlet. And this is in fact the type of motors that we'll see in small appliances. They are cheap to fabricate, they are easy to, to integrate, and uh, that's their main advantage. And usually, typically they are used for a fixed speed applications. So this PDF uh, has some animations that are implemented in LaTeX. To see them, you need to open the PDF with Adobe. If you open it with OneNote or any other software, it is likely not to work. So if you want to see it, open it with Adobe later or after you take your notes. So by the end of this lecture, we should be able to understand the working principle of a single phase motor, specifically induction motors. There are other types though. Model a single phase motor and understand the different architectures of single phase motors, specifically when it comes to uh, the starting circuit that will give the motor the initial rotation. So single phase motors are as I said, widely available in homes. They are easy to fabricate and they're typically used in applications that require the fixed speed. This is one single phase motor. Uh, this is of course not for a household application, it's more like an industrial motor. And you can recognize this as uh, being a single phase motor, not a three phase motor because of this large capacitor attached here. We'll see what this capacitor does later. But it just typically indicates that we are dealing with a single phase motor. Here we have one that is mostly used in appliances, uh, like vacuum cleaners, for example. They typically run at a fixed speed. Ceiling fans, for example, are, is, an, is another application. And so this is a small, uh, a smaller motor compared to the previous one. But you see again the presence of this piece here, which is a, cap a capacitor. Again, we're going to discover what this does later. But that's a good indication that we, this is indeed a single phase motor. And you can also see that the input only takes has two terminals, so it cannot be a three phase. So this is the animation I was talking about. It's not showing here, but if you open your PDF in Adobe, you should see the GIFs implemented in LaTeX here. So this shows the difference between the internal magnetic flux in a three phase and a single phase magnet, uh, single phase motor. In a three phase motor, we'll see a magnetic flux rotating. The magnetic flux has a given intensity. The intensity is fixed. It takes a three phase AC. The intensity of the magnetic flux in the air gap is fixed, but the direction of the resulting magnetic flux rotates at a given speed. And that is speed is what we call the synchronous speed. It depends on the input frequency. It depends on the number of poles that the machine has. In contrast, we can look at a single phase motor. The idea here is that we only have one pair of coils, one or even one coil connected to a single AC supply. And this will create a pulsating magnetic field. You see the direction of the magnetic field here is always in the same direction. It doesn't change, all well, that makes sense. We can't really change the direction when you only have one coil. So the axis is fixed and now the direction, sorry, and now the magnitude is changing. The magnitude of the magnetic field will change. If you apply an AC supply like that, 
to the coil, this is basically the intensity of the magnetic field along a given uh, line, a given axis of that mo uh, motor. It's simply a magnetic flux that goes to zero, goes to the maximum, goes to zero, goes to the maximum, and back and forth. Right? So that's the intensity of the magnetic field that now varies as opposed to the three-phase induction motor where the intensity is fixed, the direction changes. Here, the direction is fixed, the intensity changes. Okay, That's the main difference between the two. Now, we are going to see how we can um, use this concept to create, in fact, a motor that uh, has a continuous rotation. So there are many different architectures, that are, as I briefly mentioned in the introduction. We have single phase induction motors, single phase synchronous motors, or uh, what you call the uh, universal motors. The single phase induction motors operate exactly less, like an induction motor, but the only difference is that we have one phase as opposed to having three. So that's the first architecture on the left here. The second one we have is still, you see one coil, one phase input, we have a permanent magnet in the center, or we could have uh, another magnetic field, another coil in the rotor, and would then operate the motor. Excuse me, would operate the motor as a uh, synchronous motor. The third option is what we call the single phase series or universal motors. is a type of architecture that allows the motor to run in both AC and DC. So both the rotor and the stator have a coil and using commutators in the, in, in the rotor, we can now uh, just apply a DC or an AC and the rotor will uh, rotate regardless of the type of input you give to it. The single phase synchronous motor is mostly used for constant speed applications. The induction motor might be used for things that require uh, a variable speed. But we are going to focus our analysis today on the single phase induction motor. Right? But be aware that the other, uh, other types of single phase motors uh, do exist. So to analyze this motor, we need to start uh, looking at the what we call the revolving field theory. We saw that we have a magnetic field that now in the case of this motor is always pointing in the same direction. It could be positive, it could be negative, but it always points along the same axis because now we don't have a rotating magnetic field as it did for the induction motor. We can take this magnetic field phi here and you're going to split this magnetic field into two fields, one that rotates clockwise and one that rotates counterclockwise. And you see that the vector sum of these two vectors, one that goes clockwise, one that goes counterclockwise, gives the magnitude of the magnetic field and this is the direction we want for our magnetic field. So before we go through these steps, let's look at what happens to our magnetic field, phi r, the magnetic field generated by the coil. You see in the first one here, the magnetic field reaches its maximum magnitude in to, towards uh, to the right. And then it starts to decrease. So we are giving it a sinusoidal waveform as the input. It starts to decrease. It decreases more and then it reaches zero. And now it starts to pulsate in the other direction. It will start to increase in the other direction. Sorry, that this would be the one after that. And now it starts to increase in the opposite direction and then the cycle repeats. This magnetic field can now be uh, replaced or, or can be um, represented as the sum of two other vectors. You're going to call these vectors A and B and they are rotating magnetic fields with a fixed magnitude. A and B have fixed magnitude, but now they rotate at the same speed in opposite directions. Let's see what happens in the first case. If we take A and B in the first case here, they are both pointing in the same direction. We can add them up and we get phi. So phi, Z, phi r equals to A plus B. This is the vector sum of A plus B. We can move on to the second stage here, knowing that A and B are rotating in opposite direction at the constant speed. They are now moving, one moves clockwise, one moves counterclockwise, and you see that when you add them up, the vector sum gives again phi r. 
and you can keep going. We add them in step three. We get phi r when they are orthogonal or parallel, but in opposite, sorry, not orthogonal, but when, you are oppo when they are opposing each other, then we have a zero net magnetic flux phi r. And now they pass the 90 degree mark. We see that they now create a resulting magnetic field pointing in the other direction and so on. All right, and now the cycle repeats. So the magnetic flux now becomes this vector sum of two revolving magnetic fluxes, one going clockwise, one going counterclockwise with a fixed magnitude each. All right, so the magnitude of our magnetic flux must be comprised between the uh, vector sum of a plus b, the magnitude, sorry, the magnitude of a plus b and zero. Right. A and B having fixed magnitudes. And again, this is a vector sum. Okay. So A here goes clockwise, B goes, the A goes counterclockwise, B goes clockwise. Okay. Give me one second here. The PDF stopped working. There it is. We can also see this mathematically. If we take one axis along the rotor at an angle phi uh, with respect to the horizontal, the MMF, the magnetomotive force along that axis, can be given as Ni, well, the, EM, the MMF, the magnitude of the MMF times cosine of theta, that is the projection of that EMF, MMF, sorry, along that axis. We can uh, give a current to this coil and let's assume that the current is a sinusoidal waveform. In this case here, the maximum current times cosine of omega t, omega is the frequency at the input, of, uh, the input current. If you combine the current and uh, in the MMF, equation there, we end up with equation three here. So you have N, the number of turns times the maximum current times, there's a LaTeX mistake here. This should have been in, in curly brackets like that, All right? Uh, in uh, I max times cosine of theta, cosine of omega T. And if you now use a simple trigonometric function, we can rewrite this expression as in the last equation. What you notice in the last equation is something interesting. We have now two vectors or two components of this MMF, one that is shifted with respect to the horizontal line at by negative theta, the other one that is shifted with respect with respect to the horizontal line by plus theta. Right? And that's exactly what we saw in our uh, 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 graphical analysis here. These vectors are indeed shifted by the same amount with respect to the horizontal line. So one is our vector A and one is our vector B. Same magnitude, different directions. Okay. So this is the same analysis, but now done analytically. Okay, so if you now have two revolving magnetic fields, one going clockwise, one going counterclockwise, each has a synchronous speed. The synchronous speed of vector A, let's assume that the rotor may rotate in the um, clockwise direction, will be uh, the synchronous, uh, sorry, a, vectors A and B will run at the synchronous speed. And if the rotor now rotates, say, in a clockwise direction, each vector will have a different slip factor with respect to the rotor rotation. The slip factor between the rotor and vector A is different than the slip factor between the rotor and vector B because they are rotating in opposite direction. So let's analyze this. And we know now that when you have a magnetic field revolving in a induction motor, that a magnetic field will create a torque and the torque will be created in the same direction of motion as we saw in lecture 16. Uh, using the induced EMF, then it creates a current. The current, according to Lenz's law, will create a magnetic flux that will oppose the original 
magnetic field and that results in a force that it will create a torque in the direction of rotation of the magnetic field. So we have now two torques, one that is created by the revolving magnetic field A that it will now turn the motor in the clockwise direction. And we have another magnetic field that is generated by the revolving field B. And this torque tends to rotate the motor in the counterclockwise direction. If the motor is at standstill, then they both have the same slip factor, but just in, in uh, is the same for, for A and B, it's just a, a different sign. And um, if we superimpose the torques, we take torque A plus torque B, the net torque applied to the motor is zero. So if the motor is in standstill, in a static case, the torque generated by each revolving magnetic field is the same, has the same magnitude, opposite direction, the sum of torque is zero, which means that the motor is not self-starting. If you plug it in, it doesn't move, right? Doesn't move at all. We'll fix this later. We'll see how to, sell, to start a single phase motor later. But for now, the bad news is the net torque generated by these revolving magnetic fields is zero. Now let's give this motor an initial speed using whatever external um, source of energy we want. And let's give this an energy in, uh, initial spin in a way that it rotates in the clockwise direction. So we still have now the two revolving magnetic fluxes, one that creates a torque in, in the clockwise direction, one that creates a torque in the counterclockwise direction. Let's see what happens now in the dynamic case. So first of all, we now need to acknowledge that vector A rotates at omega A, vector B rotates at omega B, and omega A equals to negative omega B, different directions, same magnitude. It's obvious now that the magnetic flux, with, uh, it's obvious that the rotor will have two slip factors with respect to the magnetic fluxes. Let's start with, uh, the one that rotates in the direction of motion that is omega a. This would be, according to our definition earlier, it would be um, radians per second, or n a would be the same in RPM. Okay, so you can calculate the slip factor of vector a by calculating the relative speed difference between the magnetic, the rotor rotation in s and the magnet uh, and the um, Synchronous speed, the synchronous speed of vector A. Okay, and if you do that, that gives us S in same the same way we had for a induction motor. Right? That's the definition of the induction motor. The slip is simply S. It is synchronous speed minus rotary speed divided by synchronous speed. Magnetic field B rotates in the opposite direction of the rotor. So the, this means that the synchronous speed for the magnetic flux B is now negative N. Right? It, it rotates in the opposite direction. And you can now recalculate the same slip factor. Here is the original equation, but now the synchronous speed becomes negative uh, N, or we can say that the rotor speed is negative compared to the magnitude used in the, in the the previous one. And if you go through the calculation here, we'll see now that the same the slip factor with respect to vector B is 2 minus S. Right? S for vector A, same as an induction motor, nothing new. 2 minus S for the revolving magnetic field that it goes in the opposite direction of motion. So the slip factor for each of them is different. Okay, are we good so far? Any questions up to this point? No? All right. Well, now the analysis becomes a lot simpler when you have this in mind, because you can split the rotor into two impedances, one that corresponds to the impedance change generated by the clockwise rotation, the other one by the counterclockwise rotation. 
And here we have, if we add an induction motor, we would only, only have one rotating magnetic field. So the inductor, the, the rotor could be represented as the inductor so that this is the leakage magnetic flux in the rotor and the resistance of the, the rotor divided by S. Same, exactly the same as an induction motor, a three-phase induction motor. Now, because we have two components of the magnetic flux, we can split this into two and we can have a second circuit that represents the change in impedance based on the second revolving magnetic field whose slip factor instead of s is 2 minus s hence 2 minus s All right where this comes from again we calculated that in lecture 16 and 17 for the equivalent circuit of a three-phase induction mode so what happens here well this means that uh because this slip factor is between zero and one, because the slip factor is between zero and one, then the impedance of the one that rotates in the direction of motion will be greater than the one that rotates opposite to it. Right? Remember that S tends to zero typically. So the impedance of A will be greater than impedance of B. So the current in B will be greater than the current in A. Each of these currents create its own magnetic flux that will now oppose the magnetic flux generated from the stator. Each current creates an, uh, a cur uh, creates an induced EMF that opposes that created from the, the, the rotor. This means that the net flux around coil A is greater than the net flux created by coil B. The interaction between them will have a greater flux in A because it has a lower impedance. Sorry, a greater impedance, a greater impedance. Okay. We can now conclude that because of that, because the net flux is greater in A than in B, the torque created by revolving field A is greater than the torque created by revolving field B. And hence, the rotor rotates has a net torque that is non-zero, all right? So in a standstill, we know that S, both, both cases here, we would simply have R and R, right? The, uh, the rotor doesn't create a net torque. Now we have a magnetic flux, a net magnetic flux that is greater in case A than in case B. That creates a torque in A that is greater than in B. And if the rotor is now given an original an initial spin, it will eventually uh, maintain, sustain a torque in the direction of A. The question that we still need to figure out is how to start the motor. Uh, if you plot the torque as a function of speed up to the synchronous speed, this is what we should see. We see torque A and torque B on top and the bottom here. And you can see how their magnitude changes as a function. Their magnitudes change as a function of speed. Exactly at zero speed, the magnitude of A and B are equal. The motor produces no torque. And at the synchronous speed, what is the net torque created in the motor? It's also zero because at the synchronous speed, there is no induction. And that reaches zero speed as well. Okay, so how do we start the motor? How do we make a non-zero torque there? I will see that in a little bit. But before that, let's now estimate the torque. And to estimate the torque, we need the equivalent circuit. Let's start with a standstill operation. The standstill operation is very similar to the induction motor, to the three-phase induction motor. We have the secondary here refer to the primary and it's simply shortened to the primary. What else we have? We have the primary winding here. This is the uh, stator side. The resistance of the stator, R1, the leakage inductance of the stator, X1. We have the magnetizing inductance of the stator or the air gap X mag. We are neglecting core losses so that we don't have the other parallel branch here. We can neglect that one for now. 
And from the stator side, we have its own leakage reactants and they have the resistance of the winding. As the rotor rotates, it creates induce, it induces a voltage in the stator and that, in, that voltage is given by this equation as we saw before. It depends on the frequency, the number of turns and on the magnetic flux. Right, that would be the voltage induced here by the rotor on the stator. So at standstill, the analysis is easy because at standstill, R is simply R as we did for the induction motor, for the three-phase induction motor. What happens now when the motor rotates? Well, now we need to split the rotor into two different circuits. One that will accommodate the forward uh, uh, magnetic field, the one that uh, accommodates the backward magnetic field. So the impedances of these two branches will now change because they will have different slip factors. So when the rotor now rotates, what it can do is simply take the rotor and split that into two. And that's what we have on the, the right here. This is for, let's say, the forward magnetic flux and the bottom here is for the backward magnetic flux. We notice X mag is now divided by two X mag is divided by two here as well. What else we get? We have basically everything divided by two. The leakage reactance of the rotor is divided by two. The resistance of the rotor is also divided by two. Right. And the induced EMFs from each of them is now a, 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 e, a and EB. We see that the only difference is that they have different magnetic fluxes. So this is at a standstill. If the rotor rotates, what is the difference? Well, if the rotor rotates, then this is divided by S and this should be divided by two minus S, the slip factor with respect to the backward revolving magnetic flux. Okay, is this clear? Is this clear how we go from this circuit to that circuit? Are there any questions here? No? All right. So, in the standstill, the slip factor for both sides would be one. In the running condition, the slip factor for the forward is S, for the backward field is two minus S. And that's the equivalent circuit we have. The backward field induces a current in the rotor with a frequency of about two S. The forward field induces a current in the motor with a frequency of about S times F. Again, same as the induction, three phase induction motor. Now let's simplify this model. How do we solve for this circuit? We can take this entire branch here and calculate a equivalent impedance XA plus RA, XAJ plus RA, which would be the series of this one and that one in parallel with X mag over two. And this will now give a a circuit with a real and imaginary component, and here we have their resultant values. We can do the same for B. We can do this component and this component in series, and then take that in parallel with X mag over two. And if you do that operation, we'll end up with a real part for that parallel branch plus a imaginary part for the same parallel branch. Real part is our B, imaginary part is XB. There's a simple electric circuit. And then our equivalent circuit now can be simplified by the series circuit that we see over here. The R1 and X1 values are those from the stator. Sorry, that's not what I intended to do. XA and RA are the real and imaginary part of this parallel impedance. 
XB and RB are the real and imaginary part of this parallel impedance. And here we have the equations for them. So ZA, which would be the combination of these two, is given here, is the parallel again on the top branch. And ZB would be the parallel, the series of these two is the parallel of the bottom branch, and that's the equation for it. So this is simple electrical circuits. I'm not going to go through the development here. We have the impedances uh, multiplied, divided by their sum. Now that gives the parallel of the branch. Okay, so we are going to refer to these values very often from now on, XRA and XA. Again, this represents the real and imaginary component of the equivalent circuit that in this case would represent the top part of this branch or the bottom part for that branch. So this would be index A, index B. And now it's easy to solve for the current, it's simply a, a serious circuit. So the power developed in the air gap will now depend on the currents generated in A and B for the forward and the backward rotating magnetic field. You remember the air gap power in a induction motor, three phase induction motor was simply I2 squared times R. And if you divided that by S, that's the power that, uh, is, um, that made it, makes it to the air gap. So here we have the same, the power developed the air gap is I squared times R, but it now have two powers, one that comes from the forward, one that comes from the backward revolving field. The same way we have two torques, we have the power from A and the power from B divided by the synchronous, uh, synchronous speed of the motor. Right? Again, uh, two different powers. The resultant torque is the difference between them, which is I1 squared divided by now uh, R, Ra minus Rb divided by the speed. And the developed mechanical power is simply the torque times the speed of the motor itself. Or in other words, if we uh, want to, to if you want to express that as a function of the synchronous speed, the motor speed is the synchronous speed times one minus S, exactly the same as for the induction, three phase induction motor. And here we have other ways to represent that equation by simply rearranging them. But what we should take from these equations is that now we have two fields, two air gap powers, two torques, and then the net torque is the difference between them. The analysis here is very similar or even identical to the one we had for the three phase induction motor, but now we have two components, the forward and the backward. So part of this is now converted into this mechanical power. Now it uses the motor speed to be calculated. And the actual output power is the mechanical power minus power losses in the magnetic flux. So, sorry, power losses in the uh, mechanical part, not the magnetic fluxes. Power losses like a, such, such as friction. That's the net output power. The copper loss, the energy dissipated in the, the core, also now depends on these two magnetic fluxes. The air gap power times S gives the forward field copper loss. The one times two minus S gives the backward field copper loss. And the total copper loss is the sum of them. Okay. The total air gap is the sum of PA and PB. All right, so now let's solve this mystery, how to start the induction motor. If we have a single coil like that, we know that it stands still, the net torque is zero, the motor doesn't move. So one solution to, to uh, start the motor is to use a capacitor and create a secondary coil, an auxiliary coil, that is shifted by 90 degrees with respect to the first coil, both electrically and mechanically. So the primary winding is directly connected to the AC power. The secondary winding or this auxiliary winding is connected to the power supply, but now through a capacitor. And this capacitor will be tuned in such a way that the current flowing through the secondary is now 
I shouldn't say secondary to avoid confusion, to, through this auxiliary winding, is shifted by 90 degrees with respect to the current flowing through the main coil. What happens now? Well, what happens now is that I have a magnetic flux pulsating up and down, but you also have a magnetic flux pulsating sideways. And when the main magnetic flux is zero, the other magnetic flux is now pulsating is not zero. And by doing this, we can now assure, ensure that we have indeed a revolving magnetic field in the beginning. And this revolving magnetic field will get the motor started. This uh, picture here doesn't show well here, but it should show better in your, in your slides. So here is the equivalent circuit. We have the original circuit for the single phase, yeah, the coil inductance and the resistor. And we have now the additional resistance, uh, the additional coil that we added. And that is going to be in parallel with the first. Same, it's an inductance, it's, it's a coil, so it has an inductance and also has a resistance. But we also now add this capacitor. And there is also a switch. The switch is here so that we can disconnect this winding once the rotor gains a certain amount of speed. This is typically done automatically using um, the centrifugal forces developing the motor as it reaches a certain speed. This switch just opens automatically and disconnects this power from the main uh, supply. So it doesn't take energy from the, the power supply. Okay, so now we have two pulses, one pulsating from the main coil, another one pulsating from the auxiliary coil, and they are shifted by 90 degrees. So this operates exactly as a two-phase induction motor. All right. We don't need the uh, auxiliary winding to be dissipating energy once the rotor has gained speed, so we can disconnect that from the main supply. Okay, so now let's assume here that uh, we have an input voltage V, like that, and the, um, the current that is developed in the primary winding is IP. Uh, if C equals to zero, let's say we get IA in the auxiliary winding. We now need to tune the capacitor in a way that the current IA, the current in the auxiliary winding will shift 90 degrees with respect to the primary current. Right? And that's our job as designers to choose the value of C to make that happen. And why 90 degrees? Because mechanically, they are also shifted by 90 degrees. Okay, and that's the main idea. So we'll do an example on how to calculate this later. Here's another way to get the motor started. This is what we call the shaded pole motors. The idea is to have, it's quite interesting, is to create a additional coil in the motor pole. So we have the original pole, with the, the winding that is there. And we now make this a small coil, like a, a notch, something like that, in the rotor. And there is a small coil that is short-circuited there. Right? It's just looped around the, uh, the pole itself. So what happens? Once we have a magnetic flux developed by the main coil, the magnetic flux charges the inductance that is represented by, that is created by this coil. It, the coil has a magnetic flux passing through it. It will develop a current, it will store energy. Once the magnetic flux, the main magnetic flux decays to zero, this coil that now has that stored energy will release that energy and that energy will create another magnetic flux. So there is a small, difference in the direction of these magnetic fluxes and this could be used then to magnetize to, to create a, a original or to create a initial non-zero torque to the motor and the motor can start spinning right so in time t1 we have the main coil providing the magnetic flux and in that process it charges coil the uh, the uh, small coil once the main magnetic flux decays to zero the small coil releases 
its magnetic flux, but you see now that it does that in a slightly different direction. So the magnetic flux is indeed changing a little bit. And in time three and four, the process repeats, but now in the opposite direction. Okay. And that's the uh, main idea. Now let's prove that our idea works. Let's look at back at the, uh, the one with the capacitor. We have two coils, one that creates a flux phi P, that is the principal flux, that is the original one that is connected to the power supply. This flux, according to the double field uh, theory, is the result of two vectors, that is vector AP and vector BP. And you see here that they are shifted by a certain amount. Or they have, uh, they are shifted by the same amount with respect to phi P. The auxiliary winding that we added with the capacitor will create a magnetic flux and that magnetic flux is shifted with respect to phi P by 90 degrees. Phi A, the auxiliary flux, is also a result of two fluxes, that is BA and AA. What happens here? Now we can look at the resulting vectors. The forward magnetic fluxes are adding up. The forward magnetic fluxes are pointing in the same direction and they are going to add up. The backward magnetic fluxes are pointing in opposite directions and they cancel out. Right. So the auxiliary winding cancels out the backward magnetic flux. Okay. And the forward fields add up. So we can see the advantage of using the auxiliary winding that it gives a net torque that is non zero. And that's how the motor gets started. Okay, so that's the theory for the single phase motors. It's relatively simple compared to induction motors, the three phase induction motors. It's the same principle, it's just expanded with two revolving magnetic fluxes, and that's what makes the analysis easier to, to expand. Are there any questions? One question. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was wondering, can you explain again the operating principle of the shading, uh, the shading coil? Yeah. Okay. So, let's let's make this analysis a bit different. Let's put a a, a coil like that for the auxiliary winding. And let's just short circuit this auxiliary winding. If the main winding provides a, a, a magnetic flux, this will create a magnetic flux that will also affect what the, this auxiliary winding sees. And because it is short circuited, it will see a change in magnetic flux, it will develop a current, the current stores energy in the inductor. Right? Once the main flux is gone, the inductor doesn't doesn't like to see a drop in magnetic flux. So what it is going to do is going to release the energy it has to try to maintain that magnetic flux going. Right? It eventually just dissipates the entire energy it has stored. So in the first cycle, we have a magnetic flux that is pointing that way. And it's coming from the coil. When this one decays to zero uh, during the cycle, then the secondary coil will release the energy it had. And when it releases the energy, it will create a magnetic flux pointing in a different direction. So the flux is in some sort revolving. The difference compared to, uh, the difference here is that these coils are not the auxiliary winding at a 90 degrees. They are simply built in the pole itself. It's simply a coil that is short circuited around the pole like that. Why not putting these coils, let's say, like this, a coil that goes this loop like that? Because if the coil was looped like that, the magnetic flux it would create when it releases the energy would be in the same direction as the principal flux. And that doesn't help at all. 
Hence the idea of shifting them in space so that their magnetic flux is shifted with respect to the main magnetic flux. And that now creates a changing in direction of the magnetic flux and that is sufficient to get the motor started. Okay, is that, does that make more sense now? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Somebody else had a question? Oh, yes. I had a yeah. question about the last slide. So, if the currents for the auxiliary and the primary are 90 degrees out of phase, does that mean that you'll never have a full magnitude um, flux A and a full magnitude flux P at the same time? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Right. Thank you. But that, but that doesn't prevent the backward revolving field to be to cancel out. Mm -hmm. right. If not completely gone, at least they will be uh, reduced by certain amount. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? No. All right, so let's do some exercises. Let's just start here. Uh, I don't know if it is worth spending time with this one. Uh, we can do this on the uh, the tablet directly just to save some time. It's very simple. A one phase, 120 volts, 60 hertz, four pole induction motor is rotating in the clockwise direction at a speed of 1728 RPM. Calculate the unit slip of the motor for the following cases in the direction of rotation. What is the slip of the motor in the direction of rotation? Let's calculate the synchronous speed first. What is the synchronous speed for this motor? It's 120 times F divided by four by P, which is 120 times 60 divided by four. And that is, well, by now we all know, 1800 RPM. And you could see from here, right? We just would just be under that. So the, it should be 1800. So what is the slip in the direction of motion? 1800 minus the speed of the rotor, 1728 divided by 1800. And this is 0 0.04. What is the backward slip is 1800 minus now negative 1728. And this gives one point 96 or same as 2 minus s see 2 minus s okay so that's just simple just very simple just to acknowledge that uh these two slip factors are significantly different uh, which will change the impedances of the equivalent circuit for the forward and the backward revolving fields all right just as a reminder uh, let's do exercise 98 and focus more on that one all right here it is uh what do you have in exercise 98 120 volts six four pole 60 hertz 1730 rpm single phase motor has the stator and the rotor parameters shown friction and windage loss dissipate 73 watts of the useful power determine the input current power and power factor develop torque output torque and efficiency rotor copper loss all right so let's do this one so we have the motor with all these parameters and you want to calculate torque power etc so if you want to calculate the input current for example our first step it will be to determine the the Sorry, the power would be to determine the input current going in. And to do that, we need to calculate this branch and this branch, take the parallel of this, the parallel of that, and calculate our ZA and ZB there. Right. So this would be the equivalent circuit that as shown here. When you have 1.63J and 1.35 over S in series, and this series is in parallel with 27.86J. That gives us an impedance that is calculated as ZA. Notice that at the top field here, the top circuit has a slip factor of S, 
the bottom one has a slip factor of two minus s. And s being zero, uh, s we can calculate from the speed that is given. Is this clear? This transition here is clear. Yeah? yeah. All right. Very good. And then you see the equivalent impedance for A and B. This is the equation you had in the lecture notes. So you don't have to repeat that by hand. Uh, ZA is RA, real part of Z, plus XAJ, imaginary part of ZA, which is given by this parallel. And then we have the same for B. The only difference is that we are were, were dealing with S here, that it becomes 2 minus S instead. Okay, so this equation comes straight from the lecture notes. And, and again, this equation is just this parallel here. So let's calculate the input current. To calculate the input current, we'll need the entire impedance. And clearly, the impedance is a function of S. So we need to determine the slip, the slip factor. What is the slip factor in the rotor? Is S... Uh, S equals to, what is the uh, synchronous speed for a four pole, 60 hertz motor? 1800, right? So the synchronous is, is 1800. So S is 1800 minus 1730 divided by 1800. And this is, 0 0.039, okay, that's the slip factor. All right, so what else can we do now? We, can, we have the slip factor, we can calculate ZA and ZB. So ZA, which is RA, remember that we need this RA for the torque calculations plus JXA. This is given by this entire expression there. So let's calculate that. That is zero point five x n. So notice here, there's a little bit. There's a little trick here. Is this zero point five x mag? Already, it is half of x mag from an, from the uh, original circuit. But at this twenty seven point sixty eight is already the half of X max. So this is 0 0.5 X max. Okay, so avoid that. I didn't explain that, but this is already half of the original circuit. Okay, so that is then for X, uh, for ZA, we have 27.86, that is X mag J times, what do you have there, 0 0.5, x2 prime j which is the 1.63 j there so 1.63 j plus 0 0.5 r2 prime over s which is 1.35 over s and s here is 0. 0.39, right? And this is all divided by R2 prime over S, again, 1.35 over S, which is 0 0.039. This is for the forward rotating field. And plus J times the sum of the reactances. So it's 1.63 plus that. All right, so 27.86 plus 1.63. Yeah. Any any questions here? You know, you see where these numbers come from, and you see also that. 0.5 x mag or 0.5 x2 prime is in the the diagram here this is already half of the original impedance right and this will be the case for all the exercises 
So this is easy to calculate. It's just a bunch of complex numbers. I'll give you the result here that it should be 13 plus 16.79 J ohms. Here we have our R A and here we have our X A. Okay. Any any questions so far? No. All right. So let's do Z B. What do you have for Z B? Well, we have exactly the same. One point sixty three J plus one point thirty five divided by one point thirty five plus J twenty seven point eighty six plus one point sixty three. What is the difference? Well, the difference is that here instead of S, we have two minus S, so two minus zero point zero thirty nine. And here we have uh, the same 2 minus 0 0.039, because this is for the backward revolving field. And this gives a total impedance of 0 0.61 plus 1.55 J omega. Here is our R B, and here we have our X. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. So if there are no questions, we can continue. There are no no questions here. All good. All right. So really, the only difference is these things here. All right. So hearing none, we can determine the total impedance. What is the total impedance? as seen from the input in this circuit. Is it what just, is the total impedance? Is yeah. it just 2.9 plus 3.26 J plus the two things you solved for? Exactly, plus the two things, that is ZA plus ZB. That's the series here that we see there, right? The things I just solved for. So I'll give you the result for this. Z in is 16.51 plus 21.6 J omega, or this would be the same as 27.19 with a angle of 52.61 degrees. Oops. So that's the total impedance. So now we can finally answer the first question. What is the input current? What is the input current? Well, the current is simply V over Z in, which is 120 volts divided by 27.19 and an angle of 52.61 degrees. And this gives 4.41, an angle of negative 52.26 degrees amps. What is the power factor? Power Question. factor, yep. Why does the angle change when you go from the top to bottom? It's 52.26 from 52.61. Uh, because I made a mistake, 6.1. Yeah, this is 6.2, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 6.1. Yeah, somehow I copied and made that on my notes here. This is it 20? Okay, well, as a, it could be 26. I now don't know which one is it, but it's just a mistake from my end. But you, you know what is happening, right? What is the power factor? The power factor is the cosine of negative that angle, so cosine of 52.61. 
and this gives 0 0.61 lagging current lags behind the voltage what else can you calculate now we can calculate the power what is the input power is p is v times i times cosine of the angle so times the cos v times i times cosine of the angle so times the power factor right, the real power cosine of the power angle which is here is 0 0.61 so 120 times 4.11 times 0 0.61 this is 331.16 watts. And this is the input power given to the motor. Question? Yep. Uh, where did the 4.11 come from? This is the current here. Oh, okay. V current times voltage times cosine of theta for the real power cosine of theta turns out to be oh well, is always the power factor i think the current changed again something else Did it? went from 4.41 to 4.11 i think oh uh, i meant to write 4.4 4. Here, here sorry about that any any questions? Uh, question. Yeah. For the input power, um, I'm getting three twenty-two. You're getting three twenty-two. Yeah. Three hundred and twenty-two. Okay. Um, I think you made it. Um, maybe like fifty point six or fifty-one, something like that. Okay, three twenty-two. All right. If that's with the values we have here, that is 322 then. And we must have made uh, 322. Okay, 322 watts. Okay, we must have made uh, an approximation somewhere. Or accidentally entered four points. 11 instead of 4.41 okay any any other questions no okay so if there are no questions then we can go on to question b which asks for the developed torque output power and efficiency so the developed torque give us the the mechanical power from the mechanical power we can subtract the losses to calculate the actual output torque and from that actual output torque we can finally found, find the efficiency of the motor let me just clean this i will display the slide here so you don't need to watch me doing this and uh, let's do then question B so I'm going to uh, brush a little bit through this one because I want to cover another exercise or the um, capacitor example how to determine the capacitor to get the motor started Okay, this is almost almost done. All right. Okay, so question B is the developed torque, output power, and efficiency. 
So let's start, let's just start with the output power. The synchronous speed that we had here was in uh, RPM. We can calculate the synchronous speed in the radians per second, and what it would, would that be? Synchronous speed would be omega s. which is ns times 100 times 2 pi divided by 60. And this is 18 point, it's not 18, 188.5 radians per second, right? This is the synchronous speed in radians per second, in RPM. This is the same in radians per second, just so we have it there. Let's calculate the torque output. How do you calculate the torque output? Well, we need our A and our B that are the real and imaginary components of this impedance. And according to our calculations, we had ZA as 13.1679J and ZB equals to 0 0.61 plus 1.55J. So here we have RA and here we have RB. The torque developed in the motor is the current is squared divided by the synchronous speed times RA minus RB. Now we can see here when they are the same, which is in the case in standstill, this gives zero indeed. So the torque is the current we calculated before, 4.41 square the synchronous speed in radians per second is the one we just calculated there 18 8.5 and the differences between ra and rb that's 13 minus 0 0.61 and this gives a net torque of 1.28 newton meters. All right, this is the torque. Okay, so the motor torque is here. Now the mechanical power, what is the mechanical power? The mechanical power, let's call that a PM, and how do you calculate the mechanical power? Is it just torque times motor speed? Torque times motor speed, very good. Torque times motor speed, not synchronous speed. Torque times motor speed. So the torque times the motor speed, which as a function of the synchronous speed is the synchronous speed times one minus S. So we have 1.28 times 18.5, times one minus the slip factor 0 0.039, which gives 231.78 watts. Okay, this is the mechanical power developed in the road. What is the output power? The output power is not necessarily this one, because in the way, we have friction, we have other losses, and that will take power from this net power. And that is given in the problem. The problem says that friction and windage loss dissipate 73 watts. So those 73 watts will need to be taken from this before we get a useful power in the output. So the output power, let's call that a P out is going to be P motor minor minus P loss, which is given in the problem as being 73. And here is the mechanical power 231.78 minus 73. This gives a total power in the output was 158 watts.
What is the efficiency? What is the efficiency? It's just P out over P in. Exactly, P out over P in, which is P out is 17158. And P in, it was 322, right? Some, for some reason, now I hear my notes, I have 322. So I don't know where I got that other number from. And this gives an efficiency of 42%. Not, not great. 42%. And the last question is the rotor copper loss. So it would be question C. Copper loss. How do you calculate the copper loss? We have two to calculate. Let's call that. All my markers decide to fail exactly at the same time. They're synchronized. Copper loss is the copper loss from the forward and from the uh, reverse magnetic flux. So that's S times PA, power in the air gap. This is the uh, slip factor with respect to this power, and we have 2 minus S PB, uh, air gap power from the forward for the reverse magnetic flux. And this gives PC equals to what is PA? That is I squared times RA. And what is PB? Now you guess is I squared times RB. can factor i here i squared is 4.41 uh, squared times s 0 0.039 times ra 13 plus 2 minus s so 2 minus 0 0.039 times rb 0 0.61 And this gives a copper power loss of 32, 33.12 watts. Okay, simple question. Interesting final examination question. You know that a final examination that we you have. Okay, this is relatively this is easier than the than uh, induction works. I think. Any questions here? Are there any questions? Your power in is that equal to your mechanical power? The power in is not equal to the mechanical power. Uh, what what was the power in? You put 322. 322. And is that the mechanical power? What is the power? The power in, sorry, the power in that we need here is the electrical power in, right? Is the electrical power that we deliver to the motor. The mechanical power is 231. This is the, uh, the power that the motor takes, which is V times I times cosine of the power factor. Or times the power factor. Yeah? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right. So, hearing none, let's do one last exercise. That will be exercise 90. Here it is. I need to adjust the configuration of my slides now that uh, my settings changed overnight. So in this example here, we have a one phase 120 volt 60 hertz induction motor, and it has the following impedance parameters at standstill. Determine the value of the capacitor C to be connected in series to the auxiliary winding, in series to the main winding, and that's the auxiliary winding, 
Oh no, okay, in series to the auxiliary wind, in series, all right. In series to the auxiliary winding to produce a forward MMF wave. If you want to produce a forward MMF wave, that means that we need to cancel out the back revolving magnetic flux, which entails that this current in the auxiliary winding must be 90 degrees out of phase compared to the primary. So I'll let you think about that for a minute. How do you determine C such that the currents flowing through these two branches are exactly 90 degrees out of phase? The first branch is the motor parameters. There is nothing we can change there. But now in the second branch, we can tune, we can choose the value of C so that the currents in these two branches are 90 degrees out of phase. So I'm going to erase this and then we can do that quickly. That's the problem with a uh, light board. It takes a while. Okay. And then there is a lot of static electricity. Makes me not want to touch my, my stand here. All right, okay, that's it. So here we have the main winding. This is the rotor wind uh, the stator winding this is the one we added and it's mechanically at 90 degrees so we want these two currents to be 90 degrees out of phase how do we select c what would be the procedure um find the phase of the first current and then add 90 degrees to that and equate for c very good find the phase i don't even have to answer this find the phase for that then calculate find the phase for the other one as a function of C, take 90 degrees from this one and make and choose C to match then this minus 90 degrees. So let's start with the primary winding phase. What is the phase of the primary winding? The primary winding has an impedance Z, it's called a ZP, 2.8 plus. 4.8 J, the angle in this phase here, in this um, uh, in this phase is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. And this gives 59.74 degrees. We require the auxiliary winding to have a current that is 90 degrees uh, out of phase. So the impedance of the secondary winding must be at a phase of, let's call that theta. A for auxiliary winding, it must be this minus 90 degrees or 90 degrees minus that, that doesn't matter. So that minus 90 degrees. Could it be plus 92? Could be plus 92, yeah. Which is negative 30.86 degrees. Now I'm kind of cheating here because I know that this will lead to easier calculations, right? But you can't know until you choose, you, you go through the process. If you do 90, 90 minus this or plus 90, it doesn't matter. I'm choosing it this way because simplifies the what is now the impedance of this secondary branch? The impedance, let's call that ZA, is 6J plus 8 plus, let's call the reactance created by C, let's call that XC. So XCJ. So ZA is 8 plus. 6 plus x c j 
What is the angle here? The angle is the inverse tangent, a tan of the imaginary part, c plus 6 plus xc divided by 8. And we want this to be that, negative 30.86 degrees. We have everything here except for xc. We can solve for xc, and xc is 10.67 ohms. Ten point sixty seven. Would it be J ohms or? Uh, no, J, this is the, the magnitude. Uh, the, when we move it here, it becomes J. See, that's times J. Oh. This is just a scalar. How do you calculate C now? How do you calculate C? The capacitor value. Would you just set it equal to the one over JWL or JWC? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. So just equate this to XC. Now I'm having fun with my markers today. XC, there it is, equals to one over two pi times F times C. Well, XC is 10.67 equals to 1 over 2 pi f is the frequency given as 60 times c. So for c, that's 248.6 micro 